Welcome back to another episode of Willow Develop. My name is Jerry, and today we're gonna to be testing out a roll of Agfa Color Special from the 1970s. Let's get started. All right, let's jump into it. So uh, today, like I said, we're gonna do the Agva Color Special and gonna go ahead and open it up. What I think is cool about this already is you can see the difference in box size. So I don't know what this is gonna look like, but I'm very excited about it. Um, it's from 1976, it was ASA 80 in 76. So we're looking at oof, almost five stops of exposure. So what, 40, 20, 10, five, two and a half. Um, yeah, around two and a half. Uh, <laughs> so this is a, a color negative too from that era. And um, I, I have been looking up some of the history. I'll be talking a little bit more about it later, but it does look like this was, oh my God, this is so cool. Uh, this looks like it was competing with Kodak for a little while and they had like a proprietary process um, that I think just eventually, yeah, just eventually had to go away, budgets, whatever. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure Kodak figured out something to, to kind of talk to them about and um, and maybe they yeah maybe it just wasn't as well known or but we're gonna we're gonna dive into the history later but yeah we have a little little book here uh, so here we go uh, Agrifoller negative film is a fine grain daylight um, yeah everything's there so they have a little just a normal sunny sixteen guy where possible use an exposure meter. Um, Camera should be loaded or unloaded in subdued light only. Miniature films should not be rewound into the cassette any further than the beginning of the narrow leader. Well, what does that even mean? All right, let's check it out. I have never, this is, yeah, this is the first time I've opened a roll of film that has not been in a case and it's like in aluminum. It's kind of like in a, just open it up. This is wild. Oh, so cool. Um, so that's what I think they were saying, like don't let it go all the way into the canister. So I don't know if we'll have to, we'll have to try that out. But once again, um, you can see that it's kind of the same as the other ones, very skinny, very long. And, um, but yeah, the like, whoa, that's just, just so cool. Like all, like how old it is. Um, I'm also, this is like the second or third one that we've noticed that has just like the black canister with a sticker on it, which I think is really kind of interesting. And so, cause that's basically what we do with the collective is we just make a sticker that goes on there and um, that way you can, you can reload it and everything like that. So um, with that being said, we're going to load up a camera and take it out on the streets and see what we get. So we'll be right back. All right, it's time for some history. So um, looks like Kodak did originally invent color before Agfa, and then Agfa created its own version of it and was actually doing better way back in the day. So whenever it got to the Kodachrome times though, that's when things got a little dicey, I guess, with Agfa. So Kodachrome and Kodak couldn't use their proprietary system because it was multiple dyes. This is a lot deeper than we're gonna have time in this 30 seconds, but uh, pretty interesting kind of stuff that was going on. And then once again, there's a, another World War II element of it. And basically Agfa was seized their patents and that ended up kind of uh, influencing the development of Fuji and Kodak after the fact. And so the reason that Agfa never really made it past the Kodachrome days is because Kodak was using C41. They invented that and ended up kind of taking over the market. So. Pretty interesting kind of stuff. Let's check out some prints. It worked, but not without a lot of experimentation. So let me run you through it really quick. So this is the Agfa Color from 1976, and um, this is the oldest roll of cover color film I've ever shot. And color film in general at that time, you would have had a lot of, um, I think Kodachrome would have been around at that time and which was, you know, slide film. So that had been a little bit different, but Kodak also had some color film. And as we learned from the history part, this was the competitor to Kodak's color film of that time. Clearly it didn't, didn't win out that kind of, uh, battle, but in doing so, with this specific film, when doing the research, I realized that they do not make these chemicals anymore. And they also, the chemicals that it was supposed to be made for needed to be at a lower temperature. 
And so, as you've seen in some of the other episodes where we've accidentally melted off the emulsion, I wanted to make sure that this didn't happen today. And so, whenever I went through this, I actually uh, ended up stand developing. And I'd never stand developed anything before let alone color. So there is not a lot of information out there on the world or out there on the web about stand developing. Um, besides, you know, just like put it in at room temp, leave it for 45 minutes, kind of things like that. And come to find out that's basically what it is. So if you've been thinking about stand developing, it's not really as hard as you think, but I would definitely use it as like a last ditch effort to save the film. I knew if I developed this at temperature, I'd end up with basically an empty piece of film. It would melt off the emulsion. And so I didn't want that to happen this time around, so I stand developed. So these images here were stand developed for 40 minutes, 45 minutes in developer. I did the two-step developer and Blix from, uh, from Cine still, so it was only two steps, so I made it a little bit easier. I stand developed at room temperature for 45 minutes. I agitated for the first minute, just kind of constant, slow agitation. A couple of taps, try to get the bubbles off of it, and then I let it set for 20 minutes. I did it again for a minute, let it set for another 20, 25 minutes, and then I switched it out, and then I did the same thing with the Blix, which is the step two. Um, so if you're trying to accomplish this, the stay and develop technique will work. If you find some of these older ones, it might be worth it. So definitely do some research because some of the bases, or some of the emulsions were made for lower developing temps because at that time, that's what the chemicals were. And if you go too high, it will literally just evaporate it, which is, uh, uh, which is wild whenever it comes out of the developer and it's just an empty piece of film and there's a bunch of like sludge at the bottom. Almost feels like a bunch of rim jet, except for it's actually like, it is the emulsion like. But yeah, so these are pretty interesting. Uh, you're not gonna get this with any other film, that's for sure. Um, but I also, uh, I don't, it feels like I got some reticulation, which is kind of interesting because reticulation, from my knowledge, I've actually never had it happen before. I've only read a bunch about it. But a lot of times it says it comes from like drastic changes in temperature, but I did everything at room temperature. So uh, I, I don't know. It might've been because I cross-processed it in C41 chemistry when it might have been made for something else at some point, uh, but I'm not quite sure. This one here, whenever you, uh, whenever you see it full screen, uh, you'll kind of see that it looks like it reticulated, and which I've been wanting to make happen for a while, and it's just never happened. So I got it now, but now I'm even more confused about how it actually happens. So if anybody knows more about reticulation, uh, more specifically how to make it happen like consistently, because uh, it does have a pretty cool effect the way that it looks, especially if you wanted it to do that. Um, but like I said, for this one, what do we have? Uh, I did this one at ISO 2.5. This was originally an 80 ASA film, and so, but with the kind of five decades, five stops, as we've been talking about, I'm able to get down to what I need to do. Um, I got a couple of little street photographs of people like crossing the street and everything like that. Once again, these are all shot from the hip, so um, that's why they're, they're framed a little bit lower. It's not me kneeling down or anything like that. Um, but the blues and pinks and greens, like all the magenta shifts and everything like that, um, drastic shifts in color from, I mean, I don't know where this film was from. Uh, I, we got it in a, a bag with a bunch of other film and I have no clue I have no clue what anybody was doing with it. I don't know where it was at before it got here. I don't know what temperature it stayed at. Um, I'm guessing it wasn't kept frozen or in a freezer or in a fridge. And so it is what it is. But you can see that it kind of like developed into these like three different camps of like this kind of green, this kind of blue, and then, you know, kind of these like magenta. Uh, so which is kind of odd because these were all at different places on the roll too. I don't know, I don't know what happened. Um, once again, it's setting in developer for 45 minutes that may not be consistent because of how it landed on the film whenever it got shook up and you know, it's, it is just what it is. But the cool thing is that this still came out. I mean, this is a 50 year old of roll of film and it's, we're still getting pictures on it. And, um, and I think they're pretty, pretty unique. And, you know, while they're not like the best quality by any stretch of the imagination, they wouldn't exist no matter like this would never exist any other way. And I think that's what's been so cool about putting this project together is all of these film stocks, for one, somebody was basically throwing them away, ready to throw them away. And now that they're not thrown away, they're capturing something. They're getting to see light again at the end of the tunnel, if you will, not the end of the tunnel, uh, out of the canister. But 
these are not replicated. You're, you could try to figure out how to do this in post. You could try to figure out how to do this in Lightroom. You could try to figure out how to do this with filters and presets and all those kind of things. But, or you could just go out and shoot some old film and see what happens. So um, once again, this is the Agfa Color Special um, from 1976. And so, like I said, it was a competitor to Kodak. It didn't make the cut, and so it kind of ended up going away. And um, I don't know if we'll find another roll of this one. This one seems to be pretty hard to find um, uh, whenever I was trying to look it back up. But if we do, we'll see if we can get some on the store and if you wanted to play around with it. But um, nonetheless, check out the store right now. As of recording this, we do have some Agfa that's way newer. We have some Agfa Ultra 100. We have a bunch of Fuji stocks and things like that. So we're getting things in from all over the world uh, that have been stored a little bit better than this one was. Um, but so you can go over and check out tccfilm.com, check that out, and, uh, and, and grab yourself a roll. Uh, and whenever you shoot uh, your roll and you process it, uh, make sure to tag us in it. We'd love to see what you capture with it. So uh, be kind to everyone. I hope this was informative and helpful, and uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I hope you have a beautiful day. See you next time.